Well, please turn with me to uh, Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 6. I hearkened and heard, the Lord said, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course, as the horse rusheth into the battle. Well, my uh, title for this evening is taken from that verse, What have I done? And we'll be looking at this, uh, what the Lord was looking for, waiting for, listening to hear from his people who had gone away from him. What have I done? It's a, it's a sentence, words of repentance. And these is the language we could say even of one who in our day has become uh, aware of his sin, has become aware of the path that he has trodden, has not been right, has become aware and feels his guilt and his offenses against the holy God, and he cries out, what have I done? How have I lived my life? What, what great trail of disaster have I left behind me? I failed in so many ways. I failed God. I failed to keep His commandments. I failed to obey the Lord. I failed to believe in Him. I failed to love Him in my life. I've lived in such a way. Oh, now he realizes after maybe years in such a state of unbelief and irreligion, he has come to realize that he's lived a life of sin and he says, what have I done? He's lived selfishly, maybe not caring so much for what other people uh, think. Maybe he's hurt many people in the process with sharp words, hurtful words, and he's wounded others. Maybe he's even terrorized other people in his past. But most of all, he realizes that he has offended God, that these are not just sins and offenses against people, but these are offenses against the Lord himself, who has been so good, who has been so kind to him, who has been so uh, uh, his benefactor and provided so much for him and he comes and he realizes what a fool I've been and he's sorry and he's regretful and he's repentant and he wants to turn away from those sins and return back to God. What have I done? Well, these were the words the Lord was listening out for in this chapter. He condescended to listen to all that the people in Judah were saying. They had gone away from him. They had turned to idols. We read in verse 2 that they were worshipping the sun and the moon and the stars, having worshipped the true God who had blessed them and done great things for them. They turned away from him to worship created things, things that they couldn't communicate with things that couldn't help them and bless them and give them life and speak to them and guidance. They, they were worshipping uh, these things. And uh, God is listening. Will they realize their foolishness? He repeatedly spoke to them. He repeatedly called to them uh, to, re to repent. Tenderly, He appealed to His people to try and reason with them and call them back to Himself. But they wouldn't listen. Would they hear the words that came from, uh, uh, from the Lord through His prophet Jeremiah? Sometimes even words of warning. And even here we see there is a warning message given through Jeremiah that unless they repented, unless they, they turned back to God, then the land would be invaded. A force would come from the north. Babylon would come. Uh, from the north, a foreign power would invade Palestine and would utterly devastate the land. And such terrible things would be done in Palestine, never seen before, never heard of before, and would carry many of them off into, as prisoners of war even into another land. But 
They could avert all that disaster. They could stop everything. They could prevent it from happening if only they would turn back to God. If only they would repent of their sins and their idolatry and return. And so God was wanting that. God is wanting them to return. God was listening here, he says. I hearkened and heard, but, no, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? God was listening closely, attentively. We could say even longingly uh, to hear these words, desiring to hear them, words that would show that His people were now sorry for their sins, sorry for their idolatry and for departing from Him. But we read, No man repented him of his wickedness, saying what I have done. They seem to be insensible, unaware, maybe not unaware, but insensible of the, their offenses against the Lord. Maybe they thought they were doing nothing wrong. Their sins had incurred great guilt, but they seemed to be insensible of their guilt. Well, friends, God is still listening. God is still listening to society today. He's still listening to this world. He's still listening to us. What is the words from our hearts? Will these words come out from our heart? Will I say this sentence, what have I done? Have I ever said that? It's a call to examine ourselves. It's a call uh, for us to uh, come and check our own lives and look back honestly over our lives and to realize how much we have offended the Lord and to realize our sin and our sinfulness before God. Oh, friends, uh, this is uh, what God is listening for, people who are uh, repentant and turning to Him. Now, in verses 1 and 2, we read, about, we read that warning of God that if repentance didn't take place in the people, this foreign land would come, Babylon would invade, and when they came, well, they would do terrible things. We read here, at that time, said the Lord, they shall bring out the bones, that is the foreign uh, army, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves, and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and served. Terrible thing would happen. When Babylon invaded Palestine, they would not only, uh, they would not only destroy the people, but they would uh, excavate those dead bodies of kings and priests and prophets and lay them out into the open before those, the sun and the moon, those gods that they worshipped. Pure humiliation utter humiliation. This was the last thing that they, those kings and prophets thought would happen to them. Many of them, they thought, well, because of their status, because they were kings, because they were, these were, we're thinking about the false prophets, not the true prophets, and false priests. Many of them thought, well, once I die, that's it. Our bodies are sacrosanct. Nothing will happen to us because of our status, because we have royal blood in us, because we are uh, priests or prophets, we have this high status. No one will touch us. We will have some sense of... Uh, 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 we will not, will not be subject to such a humiliation. But that's what they, they thought. Once they were bur buried, no one would touch them because of their high status. They felt that they were untouchable. But God was saying when this army comes in, this is what they were going to do. Excavate all the bodies and utterly uh, humiliate them. Judgment, friends, who came to them. But they thought because of their status, judgment wouldn't come near to them. How wrong they were. And it may be that we think also in this same way. It may be that we think, well, in some way or other, we are untouchable. We may think judgment will never come to us. It may happen to somebody else. 
It may happen to this person or that person, but it will not come near me. Somehow or other, I will escape, I will escape it. Nothing bad will happen to me. I, I don't know how it will happen, but I feel I can escape the judgment. I feel I can get away with it. I feel when I stand maybe before God, uh, he, will, uh, he will vindicate me. I don't know how, or I won't have to experience the humiliation of my sins. The, the, uh, my sins won't be brought out uh, into the open for all to see. Some people think, oh, I'm very clever. Oh, I've sinned, but I've covered up my sins. Nobody knows about them. I'm very clever in the way that I've lived my life. So other people are foolish. They've done things openly, but yes, I've done wrong things, but nobody knows about them, and uh, no, no one's going to bring them out. And uh, when I leave this world, well, I can leave still with a good reputation intact, and the truth will not come out. But uh, we're wrong to think like that. Well, we see an example, uh, friends, of this uh, even in politics, isn't it, recently? We've seen how some of our politicians have felt even that they were untouchable, that they were somehow above the law. While others are put in lockdown, they were having parties and uh, they were having a get-together. We can get away with it, they thought to themselves. We set the rules, we are above the law, we can manage these things, no one's going to catch us. But when the, and when the parties did come to light, they said, oh, we did nothing wrong. We've done nothing wrong. We kept to the rules. And then the, the, and then the photos came out. And then the police investigation uh, took place. And they, in a sense, were exposed. And what they have done uh, has come out into the light. Now, friends, I'm not saying this to make a political point. I'm not saying this, but just to show you that all of us are like this. We think maybe we can get away with things. We think we are untouchable where God's law is concerned. But none of us uh, really are. All of us, friends, uh, we are every individual, regardless of our status. Well, we must all stand before the Lord and be judged for our works. Be judged according to how we have lived our life. What I have done matters. I'm a responsible creature before God. I'm an accountable to God for the way that I've lived my life. Not only what I've done matters, what I've thought in life matters. What I've spoken, the words that I've spoken, every idle word uh, will be recorded. Everything that uh, about our lives has been recorded. Everything matters. And on that day of judgment, everything will be brought out into the open. Unless in this life we can obtain forgiveness for our sins. Unless in this life we are pardoned by the Lord for all our sins. Well, that on that day, all our sins, day of judgment, all our sins are brought out into the open. And it will be a day of great uh, humiliation for us. But uh, the, the question then will be, are we forgiven or not? But then look also, friends, in verse uh, 4. And there we see God a reasoning also with his people. Thus saith the Lord, shall they fall and not arise? And in, in other words, he's saying, shall a person fall down in the street? And then the natural thing for that person to do, if he stumbles and falls to the ground, well, he should get up and continue his journey. He won't lay on the, on the ground. The most natural thing is to get up and carry on walking. Or... Uh, the second part, shall he turn away and not return? That is, if he's going in the wrong direction and somebody tells him you're going in the wrong direction, don't go down this path. If you want to get to there, you need to change direction. Well, if he carries on going in the wrong direction, that's foolish. The natural thing to do is to switch routes and to go down the right way, to get on the right track uh, again. But Judah, uh, Ju this is what Judah uh, was doing. 
instead of going, they, they, sorry, they were repeatedly told of their departures from God and that it was leading them to trouble. He was heading for trouble and they were heading towards great disaster. And the natural thing you would think if they had been told this message is to return. The natural thing for them to do is return to their God, return to their right way, repent of their sins. Instead, verse uh, 5, we see that they continued on. Why then is this people of Jerusalem stood and back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. They continued uh, to hold on uh, to uh, deceitful things which they had been taught. Their priests, their prophets were telling them, don't worry, this foreign nation, they won't invade you. Everything will be okay in the end. Peace, peace, they were saying. And the people were holding on to that kind of a message. Whereas the word from God through Jeremiah was, unless they repent, they uh, would come under uh, judgment. But here we see how the most natural thing in the world uh, for them to do was to return to God, but they refused to do it. And so, friends, God also reasons with us. And He says to carry on in a life of rebellion, a life disregarding Christ and salvation by grace and grace alone, refusing to believe in Him, excluding Him from our lives, uh, wanting nothing to do with Him, that's a path that leads only to personal disaster. That's a path that will lead to eternal loss. That's a path that will lead to eternal punishment. And so when we are told these things, surely the natural thing, our response should be, I don't want to go down that path. I want to, to uh, go down a different path. And He calls us to go down His way, to turn to Him, and He will forgive us, He will pardon us, He will give us eternal life, He will give us eternal gain, He will give us eternal uh, happiness. Oh friends, isn't this also something that naturally we should be turning uh, to, turning back to God? But so many of us, while we still hold on to other thoughts, we think, oh, it's okay, everything will be all right in the end. I don't have to be bothered about all this eternal punishment. Everything is going to be fine in the end. After death, some people think there is nothing, so I don't need to worry. But that would be a wrong way of thinking, friends. Well, let, let's think a little bit more about these words. What have I done? Some people, maybe instead of saying these words, what have I done? Maybe they will say, an alternative sentence. Maybe they will say, I have done some, nothing. I have done nothing. Well, the Bible also says that's a problem because you are required to do something. You are required to do something towards God. You are required uh, to love God. You are required to glorify Him. You are required to live for Him and for His glory. If we have left these things out from our lives, uh, uh, then that's also we incur guilt. Some people, instead of saying, what have I done? Well, they say, I've done something. I've done something. You know, uh, uh, many people think in this way, even today. Many people think that if my good works outweigh my bad works, then not, when I meet the Lord, that will be fine. That will be all that's required. If I've got 51%, for example, good works, and 49% bad works, that's okay. God will accept it. Somehow we get it into our minds, and I don't know where it's come from, but we can pay a kind of penance by making up for our sins, our bad things we've done, by doing good things. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that uh, we can uh, uh, make up uh, in such a way, we can atone for our sins by doing, bad, bad, uh, by doing good things. If my good things outweigh the bad, then I'll be fine. Then God will accept me. Then I will go to heaven. This is how we think. Imagine, friends, you're driving on the motorway. 
and you're doing 100 miles an hour on the motorway, you put your foot down for some reason, something gets into you, and you, you're 100 miles an hour whizzing down past in the fast lane, and very soon you see the blue lights in your mirror, you're pulled over, you're doing 100 miles per hour, sir, the police officer says, and you say, yes, officer, I was doing over 100, but you have to let me off. Let you off? How can I let you off? Well, sir, I've never murdered anyone. Sir, I've, I've never burgled anybody's house. Sir, I've never done any van vandalized anybody. And even, sir, I've never been drunk and disorderly. This is only just one thing I've done wrong. You should let me off. Well, of course, the office is going to laugh at you, isn't it? And pro probably read you your rights and arrest you and take you down uh, to, the, to the jail and dispose of your car for a while. We can't argue like that. We can't use arguments like that with a, a human law. How much more with God's law? We cannot say to God, Oh Lord, but I haven't done all these things and I, I haven't committed adultery and I haven't done this. Yes, but you've done all these other things. It doesn't work like that, friends. I used to think like that. When I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, this is my way of thinking. And I thought, well, I know I've done bad things, but I know also I've done good things. I don't swear. I didn't swear at the time. I didn't drink. I didn't uh, do bad things. And I thought, I'm fine. I'm a good person. God is definitely going to accept me. I was sure of that. But I was sure in the wrong way. I was wrong. Because the Bible says, the only way that I can be forgiven and be accepted with God is through trusting in what Christ has done and in the atonement that He has made for sinners. So friends, if we've broken one of God's laws, we are guilty before God of breaking them all. But we've, we know uh, that we have broken more than one sin. We know that we are guilty of more than one. So when we look at our lives, I'm sure we can all say here, what have I done? But then, uh, let me just come to something a little bit more positive, because what we have done, friends, has created a problem for God, has created a problem in heaven. You see, because God wants and desires uh, to forgive sin, but uh, because He is a merciful God, but at the same time, He is a just God, He is a holy God, and He cannot uh, bypass sin. He must punish sin. So how, with this conundrum before him, how is he going to resolve it to uh, uh, satisfy his justice on the one hand and at the same time to be merciful uh, to guilty uh, sinners? What can he do? Well, the answer, friends, to this dilemma, this problem, is the cross. The cross on which Christ died. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came and he died uh, on that cross, well, he was he took upon Himself the guilt and the penalty of all those people who will trust in Him. All that was placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And He was saying to God's divine justice, punish me. I will take the punishment. I will bear the punishment on behalf of all those people uh, who uh, have, uh, have trusted in me or who will trust in me. And that's what happened. God poured out his divine wrath upon his only begotten Son, the innocent Son of God, and he bore away uh, that penalty. He bore away our guilt and our sin, and he made a way of forgiveness. A way of forgiveness was opened up so that God's justice now can say, I've, it's been satisfied because of what Christ has done, and now I can be forgiving to all those who will trust uh, in Him and look to Him. And this is, this is the gospel, friends. This is what Christ, uh, God calls us to. Look at Christ who has paid the punishment of our sins. Look to Him uh, and be saved. After you've come to realize, and I hope you have, uh, what have I done? Then the next question, the next thought in your mind, what has Christ done for me? What has He done for me? Look at what He has done. Look at the cross. Receive the atonement that He has made uh, for sinners. 
Avail yourself of what He has done on your behalf. You don't have to make one contribution to that atonement. 100% put your trust in Him. 100% believe in Him. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself comes and draws near to us and says to us, accept, receive what I have done for sinners. Put your trust in me. He presses us to put uh, his, our trust in him, in him. He offers himself uh, to us as the Savior. All we need to do, friends, is to receive him and we are saved. Receive him and we are in. Receive him and we are obtain God's forgiveness and God's blessing. The Lord is listening. The Lord is listening, friends. He waits to be gracious to us. He waits to be merciful to us. Does he hear this confession from us? What have I done? Oh Lord, I thought if I was religious, that would be enough for thee. But I was wrong. Lord, I've lived a life of sin. Lord, I've broken thy commandments. Lord, I've brought guilt upon myself. Oh Lord, how I've messed up my life and offended thee in so many ways, but I'm sorry. And I turn now from those ways. I turn, O oh Lord, back to thee. Have mercy upon me. I bring nothing in my hands. I claim no merit of my own. I plead only Christ and his blood. Lord, forgive me, receive me, change me. This is the way, friends, to come uh, into God's favor and God's uh, blessing. Let's join together in prayer. O oh Lord, again we give thee our thanks and our praise that thou art a God who hears and answers prayer. And O oh Lord, we pray that thou wouldst put even this prayer into our hearts that we may uh, have this uh, mercy from thee O oh Lord, that each one of us may cry, O oh Lord, be merciful unto me, and grant his eyes even to see what our Saviour has done, and to receive it, and to believe on him. Lord, help us, we pray. We ask all these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. <laughs>